back to the second half of my series on deadlifting. I'm David Wilson with Brazos Valley Barbell, and today we're going to be talking about program design and applications with deadlifting. So uh, if you haven't seen the, the first part of my, my deadlift series, then you need to go back to that one. A lot, of the, a lot of the stuff that I do with programming and with the applications will only make sense if you look at really how the deadlifting works functionally. So when you start there, we need to get the mechanics in line, and then when we come here to the application part, it'll be a lot easier to problem solve if, if you can look at why certain weaknesses may be showing up. So as an athlete or as a, as a coach writing programming, just start with, with problem solving. So if, if Lifter have, is having any sort of weakness, actually ask if it's a problem and, and how you can fix that problem. And if you start there, then the exercise selection makes a lot more sense instead of just throwing certain exercises at Lifters that may or may not actually need to be there because the problem may not actually exist. So. Some of the, the things that we're gonna hopefully define in the beginning is, is we need to hopefully classify lifters as far as what their weaknesses are. Now, most of the time, lifters will have varying degrees of all of these. Rarely is somebody just going to fit nice, nicely into one of these categories. They're not just gonna have weak back. They may have a weak back because of poor positioning and things like that. So uh, we, we can't classify it 100% as any of them but having a little bit of carryover for sure is gonna be there, but defining a lifter in one of these ways helps to start off with, and then we can address all of them as we go. So some of the components that make up each of these that you, you may identify with your lifters, with, with poor positioning, those are, those are pretty easy, and the, the whole last video was basically on how to position well, so if, if you as a lifter think that that may be the problems, then I would, I would start there. I would watch that video and hopefully film yourself and diagnose some of the issues that you're having, some of, the, some of the things that show up with poor positioning would just be that your reps are really inconsistent. That um, a, a lot of times if you are, we, we see this a lot with newer lifters is they, they struggle tremendously to get the bar off the floor on the first rep, and then after that it's really easy. And, and that would just be because they find good positioning on the way down. They, stay, they find tension against the barbell on their second, third reps, and their first rep is just consistently bad. Now, that shouldn't be the case. They're not necessarily weak anywhere. They're just doing a really bad job of starting the bar where it needs to be. So diagnosing those things is a good place to start. With, with a weak back, some of the, the things that happen there are going to be uh, a weak lockout, the, the lifter misses around the knees, or obviously that the, the back is progressively rounding as the lifter is pulling. So I use the, the, the term progressively because I think when we, when we get down into here, there, there may be some leeway there. Um, when, we're, when we're talking about the, the way to make the lifter lift the most weight to create the most efficiency, we may actually use some of the, the slightly more rounded backs to, to do less work. And, and so that may not, it may look like a weak back, but really they're doing a great job of stabilizing in that slightly weaker looking rounded position, but their back is actually very, very strong. So some of the things to look at there um, if the lifter is missing at lockout, they, they probably need to work on getting into a, a better position so that they can have more power through that hard position and getting their back stronger so that they can work to lock that, that bar out at the top. Now the, the weak legs and hips a lot of times shows up with, uh, let's say, a sumo deadlift or not being able to get the, the bar off the floor. So I, I, lose, I, lose, I use legs and hips kind of loosely um, where I don't want to think about those as specific muscles necessarily. We're not going to, to think about legs as the quads or hips as the, the glutes and hamstrings. We're just gonna be talking about generally stuff below the waist. And, uh, and, and so when we're defining weak back or weak legs and hips, more so weak back may be um, upper back and stabilization and weak legs and hips may be actually just creating force against the floor. So uh, the weak legs and hips a lot of times shows up in conventional. The lifter drives and their hips just jump back really quickly. Their, their hamstrings, their glutes don't have the the ability to continue to drive in that position even though their back may be able to stay strong. So that's how we're going to find legs and hips uh, versus the, the back portion. So in identification, these two in particular sometimes blend. So, so that's where we need to look at um, what we were saying earlier is, is, is this uh, actually creating a disadvantage or an advantage in the lift? So some of the advantages that potentially a weaker back position make is that the lift is shorter. Uh, in, the, in the last video, I talked about how, how long arms, the, the protracted arms, can create 
a much shorter distance that the, that the bar has to travel. Their shoulders are physically starting higher. The other thing that it does is if I, if I round my shoulders over a little bit, my hips start a little bit closer to my shoulders. And so at that point, the, the moment is less at my hips. And that can be a potential advantage for creating efficiency in the deadlift. It, usually that advantage usually shows up right around the floor. So lifters that, that are exceedingly fast off the floor, sometimes these things will show up, but then they, they miss a lot of the reps at lockout or that's gonna be their hardest portion. That's where that may be a disadvantage. So when we're, when we're programming these things, it doesn't always need to be black and white as far as the, the flat back being the best way to deadlift. That, that could be a strength that the lifter is using. If one of the, one of the rules with, the, with that defining whether it's an advantage or disadvantage is that with that position that they take from the start, that it shouldn't be progressive as they pull. So if the lifter starts with, the, with a little bit of a weaker back and as they pull, they stay in that position through the whole time, they're gonna have a much easier time locking it out. And, and so in that case, we wouldn't necessarily need to fix it. It's gonna cause a lot more challenge for them to get off the floor. So we just need to choose the right exercises that, that work well when we're, when we're designing programming around that lifter. Now, if they're just having trouble getting off the floor, if their hips are shooting back, and if they're if in, the, in the sumo deadlift, they're just not able to get the bar moving, then that's gonna be the, the weaker legs and we'll, we'll start them there. So uh, we'll, we'll address those with, with the exercise selections. So as far as choosing exercises to, to fit into your programming for deadlifting, I, what I did was I came up with a, a list of, of what I think are common exercises either in my deadlift programs or, or in programs in general that, that I've put on the board. So how I broke it up was, was each of the, the weaknesses that we defined here and, and how those, those exercises affect those. So the, the order in my mind was basically the most specific to least specific. So, uh, I put deadlift on here just as your competition deadlift. So a lot of times people will, will look past that. They'll, they'll start with, they're having trouble with, with whatever problem in their deadlift, their weak back. And so they, they think they need to do more block pulls, or so they need to do more banded deadlifts, they need to do more chin-ups, they need to do these kind of things. And where, where they really could just spend more time, devote more volume to their deadlift and get better at deadlifting, and that would fix a lot of these problems. So by spending more time doing a competition deadlift, you can take care of better positioning problems. You can spend more time holding the bar and getting your back stronger and, and by better position, get your legs stronger. And so just spending more time doing better deadlifting can make your deadlift a lot better. So that part of it needs to be addressed and can't really be overlooked. But from there, there are ways that we can potentially target more specific weaknesses with some variations. So the, the alternative deadlift would basically just mean that as a conventional deadlifter, you deadlift sumo, or as a sumo deadlifter, you're going to deadlift conventional. Probably the sumo deadlifter going to conventional deadlifter has more carryover. The, the value of doing conventional deadlifts will, will very much make, their, make the sumo deadlifter's back substantially stronger. And, and while it's not very specific, it's still a deadlift from, from the same height and uh, make their hamstrings, their, their back stronger when they don't get a whole bunch of use when they're actually doing their, their sumo deadlifts. But for, the, for the, the conventional deadlifter, doing the sumo deadlifts can make their hips stronger, get their quads stronger. And one of the main benefits with that one where it still can classify as getting their back stronger is that they have room to find better positioning. Um, that was one of the, the topics that I talked about in the last video was that the, the sumo deadlift, one of the advantages potentially is just having space between your legs where the lifter can create a nice strong back where the conventional deadlifter generally has to wrap around and maybe struggling trying to find that position. So spending some time experimenting with sumo may be beneficial just uh, proprioception in the back and finding good positioning there. So past that, the touch and go is one that I use very, very commonly in my programming. Generally, it's gonna be a touch and go conventional deadlift. I use that in a lot of off season programs uh, for, for higher reps. Uh, we, we do sets of eight, 10, 12 for lighter weight conventional deadlifts, just really going after the posterior chain and trying to get the back stronger. These I, I don't get too aggressive with as far as, as far as load. I'm not gonna be going for a, a three rep max touch and go deadlift, but we're gonna be using those for hypertrophy for the most part. So uh, the, the other big benefit with the touch and go is that if we're doing a lot of reps with this, I'm doing sets of 10 and I'm slowing the eccentric portions, the lifter naturally gravitates to finding good positioning, is that they want to make that, that lift 
as easy as possible. So um, you'll see that halfway through the lifters back start rounding that that's, they, they do a better job on the next reps of trying to stabilize that a lot more. And it's a good, good way to teach good positioning that they keep the, the bars close if these are done well. So it doesn't necessarily need to be pushed very much as far as weight, but it can be a very, very powerful learning tool for beginner lifters and for lifters who just need more muscle mass to find good positioning. For sumo, it's great for, for mostly the newer lifters. It's just spending more time in that, in that wide stance position, just creating abduction in the hips and getting stronger with muscles that aren't used very often with what they're, with what they're normally doing. So some slow repetitions for, for higher reps can serve very, very well uh, after competition for younger lifters just trying to build muscle and find good positioning. But the, the pause deadlifts and halting deadlifts, uh, if, if you're unfamiliar with them, pause deadlifts would be with the difference between these two. Pause deadlifts would be we pull from the floor, stop around our knees, uh, and finish the repetition, where the halting deadlift, I would pull to that position that I stopped before and then go back down to the floor, and I may complete uh, you know, three half reps before completing a full rep. And both of these, we would be trying to stop the lift in the hardest position of the lift. Now, generally speaking, we're going to be using these to teach the lifter good positioning. If, if, the, if the deadlift is going to be right off the floor for the, for the sumo deadlift, or if the hardest position is right off the floor for the sumo deadlifter, that's where we pause. It's just an inch or two off the floor. If, if we're talking about the conventional deadlifter, it's generally right around the knees. So both of these, if we, if we pull to that position and stop, we're spending a little bit more time in those challenging positions, and so we can build some specific strength there. But we also teach them mostly good positioning, is that the, what we were talking about earlier with the, the, the crossover between poor positioning and, and weak back is that sometimes we blame their back for being weak, where really they could just have a strong back and they could be creating better leverages, but that they've put themselves in a, in a potentially weak position around their knees and are not able to complete that lift. So the pause deadlifts and halting deadlifts give them an opportunity to keep their backs tight and spend time in that challenging position and, and uh, make that area stronger and find and try to, try to associate good positions versus bad positions. Uh, the, the banded deadlift is similar as far as its application, but I, I don't think that it, it gets used correctly a lot. Um, the, the overload portion at the top, I don't know, is very, is very specific for, for the deadlifting. If, if we're having to, to pick the bar up off the floor, that's probably, for, for most people, it's gonna be where the lift is the hardest. So the, there's better ways, I think, to get the lifter good at the top part of the rep. If we get there and we're failing, then it's probably gonna be more of a positioning thing, and the banded deadlift uh, may do that well for new lifters, but not so much advanced lifters. So the benefit with the banded deadlift, probably where, where I've used it, is gonna be new lifters having to anticipate that the lift gets harder at the top. So with that, sometimes the, the new lifters start in what looks like a really good position and they just don't do a great job of, of maintaining tightness. They're strong enough to do it, but they just haven't really been taught the reason that they need to. So as they pull, if the lift gets harder and the band starts again punishing them on the way up, they learn to anticipate that a little bit and learn to stay a little bit more uh, strong, a little bit more erect through that pull. So it can also, if we're overloading it heavily at the top and using it more in that context, it can make the lockout stronger and make the back stronger. I just think there's probably better variations to use with that. So as we're getting down here, we're starting to, to get a little bit away from specificity. The, the lifts at the top are probably more specific than the, than the lifts down here at the bottom. So the, the block pull, uh, the, it, it could potentially help with, with some positioning. Uh, the, I think it, it helps sumo deadlifters learn to open up their hips. It, it can teach the, the conventional deadlifters to start with their hips back a little bit more and find good positions. The problem is just that so much changes when the, when the lifter gets down to the floor. So as far as, as putting that one as one that will fix positioning problems, they probably just need to spend more time off the floor and this one probably isn't gonna be the fix for it. But if we've seen that a lifter maybe has a, a very good squat and they have plenty of strength to get the bar moving, but is very much having trouble locking the bar out or they just haven't been able to, to create efficient tension in their back to transfer that load well, spending time pulling some off the blocks can really help. We can, we can use heavier weights and create more output. So let's say a lifter has a, has a max of, of a 
of a 400 pound deadlift, but for them to, to really effectively stabilize and us to teach that good position, we have to be using weights uh, into the low 200s or so. And, and so then they, and they fail very quickly. I don't think that that may be enough overload for that lifter to, to get their back stronger efficiently and really increase their deadlift quickly. So we may spend more time being able to use the, the 300 plus pound weights where they don't have to pick it up all the way, but we can challenge them in the portions of the, the area or the portions of the lift that they're weak. Uh, they're already demonstrating ability to get the bar moving off the floor. So that could be a, a, good, a good tool for the programming but it's starting to get less specific and, and, and needs to be uh, you know, addressed in that way. So deficit deadlifts are one that I very rarely use in programming, but I see them used a lot, um, kind of for the same reason as bands, is that, that people think that, that by trying to, to lengthen the, the range of motion that they're gonna be getting stronger. Some of that could potentially be true is that they, they're making the lift harder, but the problem is that it's very uncommon for the deficit deadlift to look very similar to the regular deadlift is that when they when they stand on the plate or a lot of times people lifters stand on multiple plates they have to change their positioning so much to make that lift move effectively that it just doesn't transfer well now it can be a good way to get the lifters back stronger they have to hold the weight for longer they're in a weaker position with the with me having to reach further down to get the bar it's hard for me to get a, a good position so uh, for, for someone that has a strong back this could be a good a good tool to get their back stronger, someone that has a weak back probably isn't a good idea to put them in a position that it's already in a weaker position. So uh, that one, you know, and, and what I just said is an example, you know, if, if you do have a strong back, spending time doing a variation that, that doesn't benefit you very much probably isn't a good idea anyway. You need to be spending time in variations that you're weak at. So the deficit just being that it changes your position a lot could have some value uh, with, uh, with making your back stronger, but is, is starting to get too far away from regular deadlifting and changes the positioning too much. I don't think it's a, it's a good uh, exercise for most people. But the better option in that same regard would be the, the Romanian deadlift or the stiff leg deadlift, is, is that we're trying to use the same, the same principles that would make the deficit deadlift, that where people would apply the deficit, is that we're just creating a less efficient regular deadlift and, and uh, still training from the floor, but with, with more similar positions and with stronger positions specifically in the back. So Romanian deadlifts or stiff leg deadlifts, uh, we'd, be, we'd be pulling from the floor with the stiff leg deadlift, and the priority would be stabilizing the back and making sure that they're in a good, strong position. And then we just weaken the starting position with the legs, meaning that we, we make it less efficient. We push their hips back a little bit more and make them use their legs more to, to pull the bar. So there's more load in the back because the hips are further away from the bar. Uh, if we stabilize that one well, which we should be able to do with less weight, then we can kind of we can target the legs. So that that deadlift is going to be used similarly to the deficits, but probably with better results. Um, after that, we we go into just general work as far as where the weaknesses are. So general leg work can be anything. It can be squatting. It can be belt squats. Uh, it can be the the leg press, lunges, all of those things to just target uh, hypertrophy and strengthen the legs. For, for sumo deadlifters, general leg work is going to be uh, of high priority. And, and we've been using the, the belt squat in a stance very similar to what the sumo deadlift is to strengthen the lifter's hips. It's easy to keep the, the legs out there. And we can spend lots of time strengthening the quad, strengthening the hips, but without the, the load on the lifter's back. So we can get a lot of volume in that stance they have to use and improve positioning, uh, but without the the extra load that's required from the lifter actually having to pull heavy weight, um, especially for someone who already has a strong back, we can target the legs a little bit better. Now, the general back work, um, that can be the, the things like chin-ups and bent over rows and, and general, um, like more traditional bodybuilder style exercises to get the back stronger. Or we can go into exercises like a, a snatch grip hyperextension or things like that that are having to work the spinal erectors uh, and, the, and the hip muscles but we still have to hold a barbell and, and stay erect against it like we would deadlifting. So there's a lot of exercises or a lot of options that we can use with deadlifting. Um, and and the, the combination of those is uh, tough to do sometimes, but, but that's where we'll, we'll address in this next segment as far as program design and, and special exercises and how to organize them all well. 
Okay, so moving into program design for the deadlift, uh, one of the things that I usually tell lifters is that the deadlift tags along a little bit better than any of the other lifts. So if I'm doing a good job of training my, my squatting and increasing my, my general leg size and strength and my back strength, then the deadlift doesn't need as much direct work to at least be maintained. A lot of times uh, for it to, to get much better, the deadlift needs to be, be trained a lot more frequency or, or with higher intensity. But sometimes you can spend, you can deprioritize the deadlift a lot more, um, spend little to no time doing it, and come back and your deadlift may be just as good, if not better, than what it was before. So we'll, we'll address that with some of the, the, basically with the combination of volume, intensity, and frequency. Um, but, but just looking into it from a, from a standpoint that the deadlift can probably progress without much direct heavy loading, where, whereas with squatting or, or bench pressing, I need to spend a lot more time working those lifts with moderate to high frequencies and moderate to high volumes that, that I may not need to do with the deadlifting and I may be able to take better care of myself. So the first thing that we'll go into is just with the frequency of deadlifting. So this one, uh, generally speaking, needs to be low to moderate. So uh, where we said the deadlift can tag along better, I wouldn't recommend deadlifting less than one time a week, but sometimes you can get away with that. If, if you're trying to train around an injury or something like that, sometimes taking more time away from deadlifting can not hold you back as much as it would if you were taking multiple weeks off of squatting. So if you're, all, if you're healthy and there's no reason to not be deadlifting though, one to two times a week is probably a good recommendation. So with, with that being said, uh, the the structure of that can, can vary. So someone who is, is newer to deadlifting, we're, we're going to be looking into the, the intensity aspect with the, with the combination of frequency. So with, with, a, with a new lifter, they probably don't need much intensity to be getting better. So the, the positioning components and things like that are probably going to take the highest priority where we can probably do a better job long term of getting them stronger at deadlifting through just building more muscle through through squatting and belt squats and general leg work and then the upper back work while we're just getting better positioning with the deadlift. And that doesn't mean super low reps with ever progressing above 135, but we don't necessarily need to be spending a lot of time doing heavy triples or singles um, just to get the new lifter to their, their max potential with deadlift, where we should be focusing a lot more time on technical mastery. Now, the, the intermediate lifter will probably need to start spending more times into those, into those heavier loading zones. As they, as they start to get more and more muscle on their frame, less and less of that is going to, less and less of their progress in deadlifting is going to come from just lacking in, in their muscle mass. So they need to start um, executing heavier lifts to maximize their, their neurological potential there and actual their, their forces or teaching their muscles to produce more force in those movement patterns. So they may start spending more times above 75, 85%, but they probably don't need to spend too, too much time in the heavier loading zones, sacrificing too much volume. So how we always need to look at this is, is just how it's going to be impacting your total training. So if, if, by, if the intermediate lifter is going to be spending too much in time in the intense loading zones, that may impact their heavier deadlift sessions because they, because the intermediate lifter doesn't have very efficient positioning. And so those, those lifts may end up making their backs more sore. And so when they're going into their, their next squat day or the next deadlift day, they're now underperforming because they are spending too much time in heavier zones that they may not be able to, to move efficiently enough in. So doing more moderate intensities uh, with, with a probably a moderate frequency with twice a week in the in the middle ranges as far as intensity in between 70 and 85 percent probably works great with those intermediate lifters occasionally reaching above that the the advanced lifters the opposite is probably true if someone if someone has very much maxed out their muscle mass and their their positioning is very good on the deadlift they probably don't need a whole bunch of, of repetitions there there's probably not going to be a lot of potential for for increase in muscle mass with the with the deadlift i don't need to be spending uh, time doing six, seven sets of five plus reps on the deadlift and, and fatiguing my body more. There's, there's just going to be too much 
uh, intensity there for me to recover from. And so then my squatting sessions may end up getting impacted. So uh, we need, always need to look at the deadlift in the context of the whole program. So at more advanced lifters who have, have more muscle mass and heavier deadlifts should spend more time practicing those deadlifts and, and spending more time in the much heavier loading zones and then spending more time in the much lighter loading zones to hopefully recover a little bit and just kind of groove those patterns some. But if, if that lifter was spending six, seven sets of five at 70, 80%, that's gonna be a very taxing deadlift session for them to recover from and then it may impact the rest of their training. So that brings us into the, the volume component. And, and this one is, is highly variable between the lifters but I think we need to classify the, the lifters again to really make sense of the volume. So, uh, and also the, the training, the, the timing of the training. So the, like I said, with the touch and go deadlifts are probably a great way to build muscle mass in the lifter, uh, but it also accumulates a lot of volume. So depending on the, on the lifter's training status, if, if they do have a lot of muscle and they're highly accomplished as a deadlifter, they're just going to be doing too much weight on that exercise to be able to recover from effectively. And that's a whole bunch of volume. Uh, where, where the newer lifter, spending more volume with less intensity and just getting more solid reps, just with the, the goal of technical mastery can very much help the lifter progress it a lot quicker. But again, we need to take a step back and not think of the deadlift um, specifically requiring a lot of volume but just that the volume needs to be there to help drive progress while it tags along a little bit with the rest of the program. So um, with, with the design in the program here, think of it from a, from a mastery standpoint and, and that the deadlift will probably get a lot of the, the benefits that, that from hypertrophy and those kind of things from the other exercises that are being included in the program. So if we're designing the program around deadlifting and really trying to push the volume and push the intensity we have to take a, a step back somewhere else, and a lot of times I don't think that that's necessary or, or even optimal. So when we're, when we're going to the practical applications of how to design a good program here, what the organization needs to assess the total program. So as a, as a power lifter, we, we have to look at the, the program in the context of power lifting and not just specifically deadlifting. And, and so the organization needs to reflect that. So, with, with our organization of the heavy and light sessions with deadlifting or when we're putting in some of these special exercises, after each session, we need to uh, take account of what it is doing to our other sessions. If, if I do a heavy deadlift session and two days later or three days later I'm supposed to squat, and I just always feel like my, my hips are sore, my back is sore, and I cannot uh, give a, have a good session at that point, then either my deadlift intensity or volume needs to come down on that day I need to move my squat sessions back or just rearrange the structure of my training in a way that can help my, my squat sessions, my powerlifting program actually be successful. So the, the opposite usually doesn't tend to be true is if I can, I can squat much closer to my next deadlift session where if I put the deadlift session before my squat session and I, and I work very hard at that one, it doesn't tend to go well after that. So in the, in the program design, we need to probably place those two, uh, those two exercises or those two days that we're, we're prioritizing them the most or, or the farthest away from each other. So generally for my athletes, we have a, a heavy deadlift session at the beginning of the week or our heaviest deadlift session at the beginning of the week. And we have our heaviest squat session at the, at the end of the week. Generally, it's Mondays for deadlifts and Fridays for, for squatting. So at that point, we have four days in between to recover from our heaviest deadlifts to get better for squat for squatting. We usually have a light squat session in between that I think almost all of the lifters would say doesn't go very well. And, and that's mostly because of the volume and intensity that we accumulate at the beginning of the week that we try to account for that. Uh, the other part of organization and training, specifically with deadlifting, has to be that we have to account for sport form, meaning that we are deadlifting at the end of a competition. And so it's probably not ideal to not deadlift on its own or first in training very regularly is that I, I think most people probably need to spend more time or at least um, once a week doing their deadlift sessions after squatting and benching. If you get used to how your body feels when it's fresh and if you can, if, if you can go into deadlifts, uh, warm up however you want with, with your body feeling good and then you try to replicate that in a competition after a full day of being there and, and you being fatigued after squatting and bench pressing, it usually just doesn't feel the same. And so 
how I structure our training is that we usually do some sort of squat variation, like a pause squat or a high bar squat or just moderate squatting in general, followed by some light benching and get through those and then we move into our heaviest deadlift session. Uh, we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't structure those exercises before it to really take away from how the deadlifts go, but if, if we can pull the, the, our heaviest deadlift of, the, of a cycle after squatting and bench pressing, then I'm pretty confident that it will be there after only three reps of both of those other exercises. If I can, if I can hit five sets of five on squats and five sets of five on bench press, even though they're easy and come in still do heavy deadlifts, that will probably transfer much better into my competition. So we have to assess that in that regard. Um, it, will, it will also uh, help us help any weaknesses that we have maybe show themselves a little bit sooner. If I'm, in, if I'm going to the deadlift session and whatever my, my, my positioning is poor, my back is weak, at that portion, whenever at that stage in that session, if I'm weak, those weaknesses will probably show up and I can address them later on. So the... Generally what we do is we have the heaviest deadlift session early in the week and then we have a light one after a, uh, after a, a heavier squat session. So we do the squats and then we do a deadlift variety. So that would be where we would add in um, some of the alternative deadlifts, the touch and go deadlifts, the block deadlifts, those kind of things. But generally it needs to be a lower stress session because that one following the heaviest squats is generally only one or two days removed from coming back to deadlifts. So we, we use a variety that, that hopefully should um, teach the lifter better positioning or, or just uh, get them stronger for the deadlift, but shouldn't impact the training when we're coming back to it. So um, that's generally how we structure the training with deadlifting is that we, we place them far apart, but we have to put it in the context of the rest of the program. So we usually have heavy sessions first and light sessions later. Uh, we, we also use um, a lot of top sets in our deadlift training. Um, and I'm, I'm using the term a lot more now is over warm singles. Is that where if, I, if my programming for the day is something like five sets of three at uh, 82%, I may warm up past that. I may go up to 85, 87% and pull something that may be close to my OPA or my last competition. And I do that fairly regularly to feel what the heavier weight feels like. Uh, one of the considerations with deadlifting a lot of times is that we can grind through reps that maybe we don't have business doing. If I'm, if I'm squatting, it's much easier to miss a rep. If, if I'm getting fatigued and, I, and I'm starting to lose my position, the bar is rolling forward, lifters feel that much sooner and, and they get to the point where they don't feel you know, their, their RP eights and nines kind of creep up on them sooner. If we're doing a, a deadlift session though, lifters can generally grind out reps in positions that maybe they don't have any business being in but that rep that shows itself up at these, at these slightly higher intensities. So by building up to an 87%, 90% single, that really is, is not all that taxing on its own. We can get a little exposure to heavier weights um, and then hopefully represent whatever or, or fix whatever we felt at that higher weight um, with, the, with, the lower, with the lower weights below it. Um, and then a lot of times what we're doing now is we're hitting those top singles throughout training and actually building to a rep max with that top single. Uh, but there's there's a lot of ways to design that programming, and and it really depends on the on the status of the lifter. But the fitting in the special exercises that it is is complicated sometimes in that we're very much going after weaknesses of the lifter. And so uh, when we're when we're going after some of the the block pulls or the Romanian deadlifts and those kind of things, these do have the potential potential to get the lifter uh, very sore. So those those need to be. Um, generally, uh, we, we program higher reps, lighter weight. Uh, they, they might get lifter sore, but it tends to have a little bit uh, lower recovery time from them. So uh, we usually put these at that, at that second deadlift day. Is the heaviest deadlift day is going to prioritize those, and then the lighter deadlift day will, will have some sort of deadlift variation. It may be the, the regular deadlift, the competition deadlift, just at a, at a much lower intensity, followed by some some three sets of 10 on Romanian deadlifts and back extensions or something like that. But that would be more of the, of the accessory deadlift day later in the week. Um, but there's a lot of different ways to structure the training. There's really no, no right way, no wrong way to do it. And, and hopefully we've outlined a way to diagnose the problems. If we can look at it just as problem solving and identify weaknesses that each lifter has, and then we can match the lifter to some of the recommendations and not do a, a one-size-fits-all. There's 
there's going to be a lot of variety as far as frequency, intensity, and volume. There's going to be a lot of specific weaknesses that the lifter has, and there's going to be a lot of exercise that we can use to fill those holes. Um, but we just need to do a good job as coaches and athletes of identifying those and being able to zoom in and zoom out of our training and identify what that one session is doing on its own, what it's doing to the week, and what it's doing to a month, and hopefully just do a better job of planning these things. So with the, with the deadlift, the, the best advice that I think I can give anyone is commit yourself to the technical mastery of the lift. If you can get yourself to where the, the positioning does not become a problem anymore and you can just pull effectively every single time, then you can move into the, the special exercises and you can target your weaknesses a little bit better. And, and then from there, you can move into the higher intensity phases if you're poor positioning. If you never have issues with positioning, you can just practice those heavier lifts much more frequently while you're with, so you can use lower volume and you can devote more volume to the squatting and the bench pressing and probably be able to design a very effective program that way and have a very good powerlifting total. So uh, if you like the video, give me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, ask me any questions that you have, and thanks for watching.